Women say their lives were disastrously altered by an encounter with an unidentified craft. And the UFO community was the only place they could turn to for help. Betty Cash owned a cafe in Dayton, a small town 40 miles north of Houston. Her friend, Vicki Landrum, worked with her as a waitress. At 7 p.m. on December 29, 1980, the two women drove to a church in New Caney, Texas, with Vicky's six-year-old grandson, Colby, for a bingo game. When they discovered that the game had been canceled, the three headed home at about 9 p.m. We started back out of New Caney into Dayton. All of a sudden, uh, Colby looked up and he said, Grandma, what's that bright light? It was where I could not even see the middle of the highway because the light was so bright. And Vicki screamed for me to turn. She said, Betty, it's coming right at us. Stop. And it had been raining, so we couldn't get off the road and turn around and go back. So we just had to stop. I got out on um, the passenger side and holding Kobe, and Betty walked to the front of the car and stood there looking up. And I was screaming for her to get back in the car because I was afraid she was going to get burned up. The three had stumbled onto what appeared to be an aircraft in distress. The vehicle sent down a stream of heat and flame onto the asphalt and the occupants of the car. It was a diamond-shaped thing. I mean, it was similar to this, and there was flames coming out of the bottom of it. My curiosity is bad, and I was going to try to find out what it was. The light was so bright, it was blinding me. And I was standing there trying to find out everything I could. And so Vicky kept screaming for me to get back in the car that we were all going to burn to death. I just grabbed the door handle, and when I did, it just pulled all the meat off my hand. Flames from the craft had heated the automobile's exterior to scalding levels. Once inside, Betty turned on the air conditioning to try to cool the car, which had become unbearably hot. Terrified, they watched the craft struggle to regain flight for what they estimated was nearly 10 minutes. When it finally raised above the road, Betty Cash drove her car away from the scene. It kept going up and coming down. And so um, finally it went slowly up and it moved slowly, not flew away, slowly um, toward Houston. And uh, just as it began pulling away, we began seeing helicopters. And they wasn't the little bitty kind. They were the kind they used to, to parachute people out. I counted 23. Vicki said she counted, I think it's 21. But we were all so excited and, and terrified, we didn't know what to do. They were chasing the object. They didn't even let on like they knew that we were down there. So they were they were going in the same direction the object was. And they were losing no time getting there. Betty Cash frantically drove away to escape the craft as Vicki Landrum tried to console her grandson. But as they raced down the rural highway, they kept crossing paths with the strange caravan. We drove about eight miles there was a whole bunch of helicopters that were flying in with their searchlights on. They flew over us, and they were the big kind. Betty Cash, though badly burned on her hand, neck, head, and chest, managed to drive the car home to Dayton. Vicky had burns on her face, Colby on his back. Dehydrated, the three consumed large amounts of water and told friends and family what had happened. Betty's 20-year-old son tried to convince her to go to the hospital to be checked out. When the local news carried nothing of the event, she decided to wait. He begged me to go that night, and I told him what had happened. And I said, Toby, if we go to a doctor, they'll think we're crazy. I said, I've got to go on to bed. So I did. I went on to bed, and I was so sick all night, up chucking. The next morning I woke up 
and there was big gobs of hair on my pillow. And I had blisters just all over my face. For several days, the women refused medical attention, fearing they wouldn't be believed. When Betty's condition worsened, she relented, and all three went to the hospital. And we didn't know we were hurt that bad. And uh, when we did go to the hospital, um, the little boy told him that, because uh, I had told him I'd whip him, but the um, little boy told him, said, you can whip me now, but I'm going to tell the doctor what happened to us. Doctors were baffled at the source of the strange burns to Colby, Vicki Landrum, and the most severely injured of the three, Betty Cash. The illness that she suffered three weeks after her exposure was an absolute classic radiation injury. And when she lost skin, she lost hair on the exposed side. She then had diarrhea, vomiting, and all the illnesses you get, and it was exactly on time. And I don't think she would have made it up. And the other thing is I don't think that she could have made it up because she didn't know it. And she's precisely on time for describing uh, what would be a two gray to three gray radiation exposure. They kept asking me, uh, how did I get burned? But I didn't have any earthly idea that the object was a probability of radiation. All I knew at that time was radiation was used for cancer. Betty remained hospitalized for over a month with her injuries. After her release, she could no longer work and was forced to close her restaurant. She has suffered only losses from the very beginning. She was economically devastated by the illness that she had after she was radiated. I've been giving her medication for years to try to help her out through all this. Later, she did get breast cancer and had mastectomies as well. All of this, she was uninsured. No one was going to insure her in the early 80s uh, for any price, probably. Vicki Landrum and Colby's injuries, though not as severe, left them with lifelong skin and eye troubles. Desperate, the women wrote to Senator Lloyd Benston and Congressman Charles Wilson to ask for medical help and answers. I had received the letters back from Lloyd Benson and Charles Wilson telling us to go as soon as we were able to go, that Bergstrom Air Force Base knew all about it and they'd be glad to help us in any way that they possibly could. They said there'd be doctors up there that could help us. And we went up there and um, they um, treated us very dirty. Officials at Bergstrom Air Force Base told them they knew nothing of the incident and informed them their only recourse was to try to sue the United States government for damages. Strangely, however, the military repeatedly attempted to purchase Betty Cash's vehicle, but she refused. As word of the incident spread around Dayton, Betty and Vicki felt ostracized by their neighbors. A minister offered to come to Vicki Landrum's home and pray with her alone, but she refused. It was then that the women turned to the UFO community for help. 